Hi there, it's Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com with this week's episode of the Market Monday. This is the first Market Monday for the Q2 period for the 2018 market. So I thought I would talk about the entire overall feel of the Magic Gathering market, uh, where we are at, go back on some of my predictions from earlier back in November, December, January, and see where we're at today. I thought that we were headed into a bear market, but we did see an explosion in popper. Uh, a lot of those cards going from two times to three times to four times to even 10 times their value. And we're going to look at popper here in a second. Got some interesting things to show about popper. And then we also had the massive increase in modern, the entire format as a whole, especially in the more tier uh, modern strategies. Uh, as you can see on your screen, Affinity, Humans, uh, Jun, Burn, all of, those, all of those across the board went up in value. In fact, we are for the first time in a while seeing uh, decks go up in value to the $2,000 and above mark. Uh, we had a, a period where $2,000 was the, uh, it hit, I believe, before Modern, Mather, Modern Masters 2017, and then Modern Masters 2017 stabilized a lot of the prices back down, and then we had the highest deck being around $1,800, uh, $1, but now we are back up to the $2,000 and, and even Jund, apparently back to the $2,200 market. So I think that my... Uh, analysis back in November of, of going into a, a bear market was a little bit um, off. We'll just, we'll just we'll say that to uh, describe my prediction. However, I do think that we are in a cooling off period for Magic, and the data I think shows that unless it's a tier, unless it's something that is hot, Magic seems to be cooling off and trending downwards, which is not a good sign. But I think that it's also not a terrible sign with as many products that Wizards has printed and just the the wallet fatigue from your average customer eventually was going to hit the singles market um, and as more than just the sealed market. And I think that unless if Wizards continues to just print things into oblivion, we're going to see a, a across the board uh, cooling off period for not just the more casual type stuff, but even tier one popper, tier one modern, and tier one commander. So that's really the thing of Q1. Q1, all of those categories, modern, popper, and commander, we saw massive increases in the prices of those kind of staple type cards. Um, I predict the commander is still going to have a pretty good year for the cards like Cyclonic Rifts and the cards that just see a ton of play in the commander format. However, what we've seen is a lot of the cards that are played substantially but not enough to be considered like a staple in commander have been going down since hour of devastation so wizards do, or magic does tend to have these little trends of cards going up in value and like the across the board the entire uh, magic as a whole going up and then cooling off we saw one during eternal masters right after eternal masters we saw the entire magic the gathering cool off and then it started going back up uh, in value uh, shortly after six months after and then hour of devastation it looks like there is a trend of a lot of uh, prices of the non tier one uh, cards going down in value so a card that i like to showcase we found a bunch of these is the garrick um it's the one out of the corset 15 the garrick apex predator and it's not just this one it's many many cards are following this kind of trajectory where you can see that it's got the nice growth until we hit about Hour of Devastation, and then it, it that's where it hits its peak, and it's been going down in value. If we actually go to a lot of these more recent sets of these these sort of casual base cards, uh, even cards like a Johnny Steadfast, you see it goes up, it hits its kind of peak around this, this time period, and then it's had a cooling off period. Uh, many cards before that too had one around Eternal, Eternal Masters and then repeated itself again in Hour of Devastation. So that's not a good sign as a whole for Magic the Gathering. It means that people are kind of really channeling their... their or th what, what is healthy still in the game is not a an increase of players, but more of an increase of more competitive or the more invested uh, Magic the Gathering players. 
Um, for a speculation concern, I, I typically like cards that have more of a broader appeal, or I actually like cards that you can get in on a really, really low value and then sell off. They kind of creep up without the, the rest of the market, the rest of the finance community really catching up with it until all of a sudden it's, you know, quadrupled in value and I have massive stockpiles of it and I can, I can sell back into the market. So those are the type of cards that I try to speculate on. And those I think are few and far between right now, but it does give some opportunity to start investing in these type of cards because usually when there's not, when there's stagnation, there's also pretty good good deals for cards. So it means that like cards like the Garrick Apex Predator, for example, is not on anyone's real radar. No one's going to want it. I'm sure that if you go over to like, like card sphere, uh, it's going to see a low amount of trades compared to other cards in this time period. And you can, at that point, you can start to get good deals because then traders or vendors get a little bit desperate and you can find these for uh, bargain prices. And then eventually the casual demand will come back in and, and, and eat them up. So I think that this will be the Q2 will be a buying market rather than the selling market. And then we're going to have to wait till hopefully the arena can recover a lot of the player base or just that magic gets back into the trend in the game trend. And we can get a, a a a lot more new blood into the uh, into the Magic the community, and then these casual cars can be uh, started to be picked up again, and the market as a whole can increase in value. However, again, we're still at a pretty strong market. The best way to look at this is to go by MTG stocks, and you go by their analytics of all time highs and lows. And it seems to be that we are still in the bracket of mainly having all time highs, a lot of reserve list cards, a lot of older cards, a lot of tier cards, um, a lot of cards that hit their bottoms when they were reprinted in a set like Modern Masters 2017 are back up to their all time highs. Uh, again, Commander is a very, very popular uh, list here of, of cards that have continued to go up in value as uh, 2017 came to a close and 2018 started. So the one real bracket or group of cards that still continues to go down uh, was the, the 2017, this was very, very common, was foils and promos. So you can see the, the majority of these are going to be uh, pre-release cards and foil cards, judge foils from the vault type stuff that are hitting their all-time low. And it just seems to be that, that, that foils are losing their specialness or not really foils from their first edition sets um, that they are printed in, but really the one, this, the, the subs subsequent products like the from the vaults, like the judge foils, like the uh, once they hit a master set foil or an alternate foil, those really crash the price of a lot of these foils and they've just lost their specialness in the second time around. There's just not a lot, as many buyers as you'd think for those uh, type of products. So keep that in mind with, with investing in foils. Um, I usually haven't been the biggest fan of foils because of the liability that are foils. Also, it just seems that the, the, the trades and the sale, sales seem to be more tedious than they're worth with people being very, very picky about conditioning. And I just want to uh, deal with the headache of something gets, getting sent back. Remember, you lose a lot of money just in a transaction with your own time and with shipping if you have to pay for shipping there and back because someone decides that, that that's the, they kind of hold your card hostage unless you pay to get it shipped back because they don't like the way you've graded it. And like I said, I've had some people with foiling very, very picky that a card right out of a pack into a perfect fit is not considered near mint to them because of minor, minor uh, scratchings or uh, clouding or, or whatnot in the foil. So anyway, uh, it does seem to be though, with with my biases aside, that people are not, the foils market is just isn't there like it used to be for especially these, these pre-release cards, these uh, like I said, the judge promos, the uh, foils from subsequent master sets, those type of things are, are still continuing to go down in value uh, compared to the market as a whole. All right, so let's get on to the more nitty gritty good stuff of this Market Monday. So that, that's basically, let's talk about Popper for a second. So I've noticed some interesting data about Popper. So Popper still seems to be in a very, very good place. Um, Goldfish is popper and modern and legacy are messed up at the moment. So you can't see the weekly changes, but the daily changes every day still can is there'll be a lot more in the increasing than in the losing. So of course that's a good sign. However, if we go come over here to card kingdom, I've noticed that everything is back in stock at card kingdom. So card kingdom is going to act as a 
uh, kind of a buffer for prices in Popper to go up much more in the past couple of months until they get stripped of their supply again. So I think that my, my guess is how Card Kingdom anticipated the Popper market is they went all in on Popper. Uh, they sponsored a lot of the more casual people like the Tulare Community Colleges. The Popper went up in value like crazy. They sold out early. And instead of just like slowly putting it back in stock on their own website. They waited until they had it all sorted out. And just over, it seems like over this past couple of weeks that everything across the board in Popper, you name the card is back in stock. So a lot of these things have been in stock for, or out of stock forever are now in stock with many, many versions at Card Kingdom. I, the For the rest of vendors, is that isn't the case. I haven't seen the, the cool stuff, so the Star City Games or the Channel Fireballs. So it seems like the, the, the Card Kingdom made a very, very wise decision and let the entire rest of the uh, competitors, the TCG Player Marketplace, um, and like I said, the Star Cities, sell off uh, through the, the, the first popper craze while they bought, 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 and didn't list cards. And now they seem to be the cheapest price you can actually find these if you go over to tcg mid it's actually quite hard to find prismatic strands at two dollars and 29 cents we have cards like Burstler rangers uh that are selling on tcg mid uh for a buck 49 and they still have many in copy at 69 cents so that's kind of interesting with card kingdom smart move business move on their end i do think that that popper will continue to outstretch the supply like i said this is just one vendor out of the, just the mass marketplace that is Magic the Gathering. Uh, but however, just keep that in mind. I think we're going to see a slowing down in Popper because I'm thinking a lot of vendors, rather than really selling off at what the market price wanted uh, to be doing, they were buying out the stocks of cards and just waiting until the rest of the competition was was out of stock before they, they posted theirs. So again, though, Popper's in a great place. We still have 1,500 players in the Popper uh friendly league on mt joe it doesn't seem to be slowing down the medicine uh, is still in a a really really good shape uh, you can be successful with a variety of decks and it still is very very cheap to pick up a popper deck so i'm still investing in popper however i think that slowing it down a little bit waiting to feel how much of the supply is really out there in these vendors that have restocked up on these these cards um it is the more wise thing rather than just go uh, crazy like I've been going with 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 investing in basically everything imaginable in Popper. All right, so last but not least for this uh, week's episode, I'm going to give you some of the picks that I've been uh, looking at, some cards I've been watching closely for Dominaria. Now, Dominaria's got some really cool cards uh, that are going to enable a lot of these older cards, and let's just talk about them. So the first card that I really like is Barl, Chief of Compliance. Now, this card's already pretty high. Because of Storm, it's a staple of a four, usually a four of in Storm, as this is the best way to go off. Now, Storm's going to get hit, though. So the, the dampening uh, field or dampening matrix, whatever the, the card that's getting printed in Dominary is going to really be an, another hate card against Storm. Usually, Storm does a great job of fighting through hate. They can usually hate cards can be answered with a specific sideboard card. This might make Storm have to side in some more artifact removal, like the Shattering Sprees type uh, effects to get rid of uh, this new tool against them. However, Barl, how, what I'm talking about Barl is I think that Barl matches up really well with a lot of cards coming out of Dominaria. First, it's got going for it is the Legendary. There are cards like the Mox Amber that get an effect that only works if you have a legendary creature. So this one, I borrows the card that I think this works the very best with people have talked about like, a, like Ovea. I don't know. There's a lot of better ways to ramp in green. Um, there's like SRAM that's okay with this card. Uh, however, it's borrowed with that really wants to ramp up to get those counter spells. So I could, I could definitely see a turn to borrow and then you can throw out a Mox Amber and at least opt or at least for the next turn, have a lot of counter magic up. And this is the one place that that I think that it will that I, I even out of all the legendary creatures that have been printed in Dominaria, Barl seems to be the best that has the synergy with the Mox Amber. Um, it also works with these legendary sorceries, uh, Karn's Temporal Sundering, as well as the white one and the red one seem to have, or the black one. All of them actually have pretty good synergy with with a card like Barl. Uh, Karn's Temporal Sundering, especially because this definitely seems to be going in a control deck. It help Barl helps you loot, so counter loot. Uh, also, we get some really good counter spells in the form of the Wizards Retort, which works beautifully with Borrow. And then 
it will allow you to loot, which is another thing that Borrow wants to do. And we also are getting Syncopate. So I'm thinking that maybe a blue nothing, blue do nothing control base deck could be viable. Uh, we still have like Rivers Rebuke, or in this case, like the the Karns um, Temporal Sundering that work with Borrow, which we could see a, a a deck just completely built around or synergized around a card like Borrow. The second thing that Borrow has going for it is the uh, well, I already said the wizard aspect to it. There are a lot of cards that do uh, work off of the the wizard um, theme. And speaking of wizards, the other wizards I, I want to talk about is the resilient Kenra. Where I really like the w resilient Kenra is the pairing with Adeliz. So this just not Adeliz. There we go. It's the let me find it here. There we go. It's the arcane. Arcane. Nope. Nope. I'm way ahead of myself. Nabin. There we go. Nabin, Dean, Dean of Iteration. Nabin is something that I think could bring a blue-green tempo deck into the mix just with a card like Resilient Kenra. Now, Resilient Kenra has already started to see a lot of play in the red-green monsters just because it's another thing that has to be killed twice. But the Naban is really, really powerful with the Resilient Kenra because it says if a wizard entering the battlefield under your control causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Uh, so... The Naban Dean of Iteration will make Resilient Kenra, which is a wizard trigger twice, which means that it can pump itself up plus four plus four that turn. Uh, once this gets eternalized, the triggering twice of uh, the, because it remains as a wizard with a, a, a zombie jackal wizard, will trigger off an additional. So it's giving something plus eight plus eight. I think in like a tempo based strategy, if we have any like uh, evasive wizards, which I already know we do uh, coming out of the new set, plus a lot of the old sets, that this could be a thing. There could be a wizard tribal just with the green, having a lot of the better pump spells too, with the card like the Adalys and the Soul Scar Mage. So Soul Scar Mage and Adalys is already a combo that a lot of people are talking about as the uh, Soul Scar Mage is getting plus one plus one prowess anyway from the instant or sorcery you, you cast. If you have something like the Adalys, you're getting an additional. Uh, plus one, plus one. That is a very, very uh, formidable threat at that point. So keep an eye on like the Barrels, the Soul Scar Mages, and the Resilient Kenras. Barrels got the the additional plus to it because it also is that legendary, uh, which is a, a very, very much a legendary matter set. All right, so the next card is Paradox Engine. Paradox Engine is already extremely expensive. I can't believe how fast this card has gone up in value. Uh, just in the, in the fa past few months, it's already up to $13. This is mainly from Commander, uh, but we could see a resurgence of standard decks because we get an, a, a few nice little tools with the Paradox Engine. The first being the Power Stone Shard, which if you, of course, you have multiples of these, it's going to add two colorless to your mana pool or three colorless. If you, there are ways to even copy the artifacts from Kaladesh, but I don't know if that's a little, a, a little bit stretching it here, but a card, that's what, what a card like Paradox Engine wants is some, it wants to be an engine to cards like this is whenever you cast a spell on tap it. And there will be a strategy like we had with the Hedron Archive. I think when Hedron Archive rotated, it really killed the Paradox Engine decks uh, because we just didn't have a lot of rocks that were good at uh, producing mana. But then we, of course, we get the Gilded Lotus uh, in this set too, which is just a better Hedron Archive where you can you can actually cast colored spells uh, with the Gilded Lotus. So even like a card like Opt will allow you to untap your Gilded Lotus with the Paradox Engine and then just continue to go crazy. So think of all the cards like the Metalwork, Colossuses, um, anything that, that reduces the artifact cost or works off artifacts from Kaladesh could see a resurgence from uh, the cards in Dominaria. We also get a white legendary creature that whenever you cast a historic spell, it returns back a, a converted mana cost three or less creature from your graveyard to battlefield. So think of like the scrap, uh, what is the, the, the one out of Aether Revolt that whenever you cast an artifact or whenever an artifact dies, you get an artifact from your graveyard for less uh, mana. So there's a lot of these, these, these cool synergies that if you identify beforehand. Now, all of these picks, though, I think that they're all going to rotate. So I don't know how much time we have before. Usually, usually with new um, archetypes, though, or archetypes that haven't been seen, there it seems to be a big insurge of uh, one week can cause a price to spike. Uh, for example, look at the Combat Celebrant. This was a card that didn't see a lot of play outside of uh, Commander. And then it hit a deck over the weekend in, in a deck that is actually pretty near and dear to my heart, which is the uh, God Pharaoh's Gift deck. 
and it went all the way up from the two dollars to ten dollars i think it was up to twelve dollars at its height oh with the combat celebrant so some of these cards from dominaria that can breathe life into Amonkhet and Kaladesh block cards and have that but but if if you do see something like this you should definitely sell off as quickly as possible same thing with combat celebrant i think combat celebrant is a sell right now um it's just proven itself in one gp it hasn't really the deck's been around for a while you, you see right here is where it started going up because of the combo however it didn't really go up until it had this very very strong finish at uh the the grand prix seattle and uh, but again, Dominaria could definitely have some effects on cards like this. So uh, keep it keep a lookout for those Paradox engines if they do start to see play of as multiples in a in a yeah, the paradoxical outcome also seems pretty good as a way to recast things with uh, the the mana door or the not the the paradox outcome the the uh, Ithvok's Reservoir. That's another card to definitely keep your eye on. So the other card that I think really enables a lot of cards um, out of the are two particular cards is land where elves and this really enables nissa steward of elements as you can go first turn land where elves into second turn nissa and have it be alive as a one loyalty planeswalker you can immediately scry two and then set up your next zero to zero out a converted mana cost three or less so we're looking at like world of virtuoso we could see the resurgence of the energy type decks like the green energies as the land where elves could uh, play that sort of role that the Attune of the Aether. I know the Attune of the Aether just replaced itself, but ramping into that three drop early um, is, I think, I mean, you wouldn't even really need to go the energy route, but just going kind of the, the team or good stuff type deck. And the other big, big winner here is the Jade Light Ranger. I think this is going to be an incredible uh, turn one into the Lana War Elf into a turn two Jade Light Ranger, uh, as that just ramps you, uh, I mean, it ramps you into a best case scenario four three. Worst case scenario, a 2-1 with two lands going into your hand, or, or I guess vice versa, whichever one you consider better. Um, but it's it also can get things into your graveyard very quickly if, if it's something that is a strategy that does utilize your graveyard. So I think Land of War Elves is going to be an engine for a lot of these type of cards. And those are the best two that I've been able to identify at the moment uh, with the, the Land of War Elves. Again, if, if you were to scour through all the cards from uh, Amonkhet to, or Kaladesh to, uh, Rivals of Ixalan, I'm sure there's a ton of cards that benefit off of having the Llanowar Elves. And last but not least, though, the card that I actually have been investing in, I've picked up 30 or so copies of these, mainly on Cardsphere for about the 85% range. I think I've been paying to it for around um, anywhere from 75 cents to a buck 15 for, is the SRAM Senior Edificer. And it does seem to be going up in value. Uh, it's, uh, it's up to a buck 50 ish in value and the reasoning why is i think that the the white blue enchantments gets a ton better first of all we have an awesome enchantment uh to go with the cartouche of knowledge which is the arcane flight this was just spoiled i think yesterday or today as it's another one mana enchanted creature gets plus one plus one in flying of course this is going to be something that's going to work very well with a a card like an Adanto Vanguard, because it's something you can keep alive with Indestructible, it turns it into a 2-2, two, two. you're swinging for 4. At that point, you can even erase the Hazaret decks. I mean, this is what's really good about Cartouche of Knowledge here as well. But I think that this deck will want to go heavier in on the Auras, because we also do get a... Um, let me find find the, the card for you. We do get a really, really potent card from Dominaria that works with SRAM in the Aras, which is a legendary creature that, let me find it real quick. There we go. The De Danitha uh, Capetian Paragon. It's a three mana for a two, two with first strike vigilance lifelink that reduces the, the, the cost of already equipment spells you cost by one. So this is the perfect card to be putting a enchantment onto and the perfect card to also to reduce the cost. So I think it works. It's perfect with SRAM. SRAM also works really well because you don't know if a vehicles or an equipment type strategy could just hit because of historic. There does seem to be a lot of these historic cards that seem to get enabled very, very well with these cheap equipments. And that could definitely be something that, that finds favor with SRAM. And uh, yeah, so basically this is, this is a, if you're good at evaluating cards and, and good at, or, or predicting future decks that that could be things um you know usually if a card is powerful enough eventually we'll see play somewhere somehow 
and it will have that bump um, as a flavor of the week deck, as a you know new hotness type thing of people just trying it out. And that's the time to get in before that happens, sell when a spike happens, and you'll thank, thank yourself for being able to you know, evaluate and, and that, that's one thing that the, the vendors are also are going to be able to play the game, the, you know, the buy sell game a lot better than a, a, a regular person. What you can have going for yourself over like a vendor is usually vendors use this, just a scatter shot type, uh, um, how they invest. They just invest in everything at low, you know, buy low, sell high. However, if you can be the, the more uh, a person analyzing a card, thinking how it can fit in a meta, if you can invest in cards that, you know, no one's particularly buying at a high rate, uh, you can buy all of them, you know, buy into them at really, really cheap, wait for it to finally hit a deck, and then, you know, sell it off. You can see in the comment, there's already people talking about SRAMs here and whatnot. And I think that SRAM overall, out of all the cards that have existed, uh, from the Kaladesh forward that, that benefit the most in Dominaria. It's definitely SRAM. Not Mind you also that SRAM does work with this, the, the, the legendary sorceries or anything else that requires a legendary um, out on the field. Look at Mox Amber. This is also a deck that might want some sort of um, ramping uh, to get you... I mean, even a one-of doesn't even hurt too much if you have two legendary creatures in here uh, with the uh, Danitha, Kabashian Paragon, and SRAM. That's something that at least can... can you know, the, 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 the Mox Amber can uh, trigger off of. Uh, so keep that in mind, uh, these cards that I've mentioned. So let's just go through them again. These are the cards that are most interesting. This is Barl. Uh, I've also put Soul Scar Mage in that list too, except that was just reprinted in a Challenger deck. Uh, we had the Resilient Kenra because of the, really the synergy with the, with the Nabon, Dean of Iteration. I just, I really love this Green Blue Tempo. Speaking of the Green Blue Tempo, like the Nissa Steward of Elements um, and the Jade Light Ranger to go with the Llanowar Elves. And the Paradox Engine. Paradox Engine, I just think, is in a really good place uh, with the Gilded Lotus. And then we, of course, have SRAM. So those are kind of my picks for this Market Monday. Um, also, just to bring it all, all, everything we discussed in here, I still, we're, we're, we're not really in either a bear or a bull market. I think that we're, we're the, the whole market, the magic market in general is a bear. So if there is anything that is is like the casual cars or, or currently not seeing play in popper or modern or standard, it's going to be going down um, more than it usually would be. I don't think we have that just influx of players in general to keep those more interesting cards going up, even if they don't see competitive play. However, I still think that we're in more of a bull market for the competitive cards. The, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, excitement, of, especially in modern and popper, uh, for more of the co more competitive scene, it seems like the enfranchised players are sticking with Magic, and they're they're not only sticking with it, they're still investing quite a bit of money, buying new decks and and whatnot. However, um, before I I really you know get excited about the market and get place again, I think we're gonna need to see that that rise of new players rather than a stagnation or a, or, or a, a falling off of of that. What they say we got up to like 22 million at the peak at one point. Anyway, hope you enjoyed this Market Monday. This has been Kevin with RogueDeckBuilder.com. Thanks for watching.